Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with SEPTO and Johnson who will help participants understand the intersection of consumer protection and artificial intelligence. My name is Jenna Joyner and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Todd Cohen is one of the technology industry's foremost leaders on internet law and policy and artificial intelligence. He draws upon more than two decades of experience in-house with some of the world's best known internet and e-commerce companies to provide clients with practical strategic advice on critical evolving issues in data privacy, intellectual property, artificial intelligence, payments, antitrust, and competition law and content moderation. Eric Berman represents businesses, tax exempt organizations, and executives in high stakes government investigations. Commercial, lit uh, sorry, commercial litigation and regulatory proceedings involving the Federal Trade Commission, State Attorneys General, Department of Justice, US Postal Service, and Postal Regulatory Commission. Stephen Freeland focuses on practice on solving complex litigation challenges that businesses face in the areas of advertising, consumer protection, telemarketing, intellectual property, and artificial intelligence. Steve also represents clients in Federal Trade Commission, investigations, and FTC enforcement actions involving advertising, marketing, and telemarketing issues, consumer class actions, and state attorneys general investigations. Now, before I hand over to the panel to begin today's webinar, a uh, housekeeping item. You can submit questions to today's panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, but please do reach out to them after the webinar for additional information. It is now my pleasure to hand you over to Todd, Eric and Steve to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Jenna, for the introduction. As she mentioned, we're going to discuss today around the intersection of consumer protection and artificial intelligence. I thought we'd get straight in on the slides. Um, if we could turn to the first slide. So I think it makes sense first to try to give a definition of what artificial intelligence is to help um, shape what we're going to discuss today. And the simple uh, definition of artificial intelligence, it's that it's a system is designed to generate um, outputs, such as predictions, recommendations, or decisions, um, and that they're meant to be uh, driven autonomously. And it stands for uh, performing tasks that normally require human intelligence. And the important point here is that uh, it's things that we're already seeing in day-to-day -day life, including speech recognition, computer vision, natu natural language processing, and self-driving cars. Why I wanted to put the slide up was that this was generated by a generative AI chatbot, our friends at Bing, the Bing chat, earlier this summer. And one of the important parts about what we've now started to see in generative AI is the ability to provide sourcing so that it can help to uh, um, alleviate hallucinations. Let's go next to the next slide and really get into more about what generative artificial intelligence is. And what generative artificial intelligence is really, um, it does not equal human intelligence. And if we think about this setting up as if human intelligence is sugar, where are we in generative AI? So what is generative AI itself means? It's a generative pre-trained transformer. It's a prediction machine based upon foundation models for all content or large language models, large data sets um, that are processed. And then what comes out are predictions of what the next word should be. No different um, and in very many ways, almost identical to autocomplete in a search box. So if you start writing a word in a search box, 
the next word that will be predicted is very much what a generative AI chatbot does. The first public iterations, the saccharine level of the chatbot universe was last fall with the introduction of ChatGPT 3.5 and Google Bard. Text-to-text -text generative, they do lack judgment and creativity. They're not strategic. They are the kings of conventional wisdom and they make a lot of things up. And earlier this year, we had the next generation of the chatbots become publicly available. GPT, part of OpenAI's GPT 4.0 and Bing Chat, the Splenda and Stevia of the generative AI universe. So they're getting closer to what sugar is, closer to human intelligence, but we're not there yet. And one of the important parts about GPT 4.0 and Bing Chat is that they can both generate, come from generative text and now create images or chat text itself. And there are a variety of other generative AI chatbots we've been focusing on, and we'll focus mostly on the large language models. But like we mentioned earlier, like I mentioned earlier, there's also a significant number of generative AI chatbots in the areas including video, sound, um, including music, as well as um, audio visual, both individual images as well as uh, as well as film. One of the other important points about the new chatbots 4.0 and Bing Chat is that they provide sourcing and they claim that they do pre 2022 data. Um, and the, the answer when they when they released the uh, GPT 4.0, they put out a press release from OpenAI saying that it was 82% less likely to answer with hallucinations, which means that you can rely that it means that 18% it will remain 18% um, likely that they will be hallucinations. Again, those are just false um, statements that come out of a large language model that are not true. And what's next? We move from generative artificial intelligence to general, general purpose artificial intelligence. And again, I'm not willing to go to we've got sugar yet. And there's a product on the market outside of the United States called Miraculex, uh, which is a sugar uh, protein that's 3,000 times sweeter than sugar. And we don't know what necessarily that will mean to the human body. General purpose artificial intelligence is also abbreviated as artificial general intelligence, AGI, and we're getting closer and closer to the planet of the apes or our robot overlords where they will um, control everything we do. And my point of view on, the robot, on our robot overlords is who's to say they're not gonna do a better job. So we move from that to the next slide, please. Hi everyone. I, I I've always loved Todd's explanation of AI because um, he does it in a way that even I can understand. And um, anything with food metaphors is certainly something that I can get behind. Um, so with that, that was a great overview of of what we're talking about when we talk about AI. Um, and we're talking about the intersection between AI and consumer protection. Why is there an intersection at all? The answer is simple, um, because the most powerful and influential consumer protection regulator in the United States and perhaps the world uh, says there is. I know that there are a number of attendees today who are outside the U.S. Um, if you've not been following what's been going on at the FTC uh, over the past two plus years or so, um, Suffice it to say that this is uh, this is an administration and a commission that uh, has been uh, uniquely enforcement minded when it comes to big tech. Um, normally, when at full mast, uh, our, our FTC has five commissioners. By statute, no more than three can be from the same political party. Uh, right now, there are only three commissioners. They're all Democrats. And the mandate uh, is set by by the chair, Lena Khan, um, who actually initially came to prominence 
uh, by, by writings that she did that were critical of, uh, of Amazon and other big tech. And so uh, in the past, you know, only 120 days or so um, on the consumer protection side, we've seen the FTC file lawsuits against big tech companies, settle enforcement actions against big tech companies and battle with them over whether they are violating previous FTC orders. And these generally have to do with the company's privacy practices. This past May, Chair Khan uh, published an op-ed in the New York Times uh, entitled, We Must Regulate AI, Here's How. And it was a relatively short piece, but uh, she identified several risks that the FTC perceives with the expanding adoption of AI. And on the consumer protection side, we're really talking about uh, two things. One is fraud and the other is discrimination. Uh, Chair Khan wrote that generative AI risks turbocharging fraud. We'll talk in, over the next few slides about deceptive practices, but what we're talking about here is using AI to craft deceptive, misleading, outright false content designed to trick consumers into making purchasing decisions that they wouldn't ordinarily make, um, whether it's phishing emails, deep fakes, voice cloning, fake consumer reviews, fake websites, fake endorsers. Um, another issue is instructing AI to craft uh, advertising messages that are targeted to certain populations. This has been a hobby horse uh, of the FTC for some time. Uh, the FTC has traditionally prioritized going after advertisers that it perceives as targeting populations that may be vulnerable. The elderly, um, non-native English speakers, sometimes veterans. Uh, the important point that I want to make here is that Chair Khan wrote in her op-ed that when enforcing uh, the law's prohibition on deceptive practices, the FTC is not just going to look at fly-by-night scammers deploying AI tools, but also at the upstream firms that are enabling them. That's something I want this audience to remember. This is a sophisticated audience, um, and you, but it would be incorrect to think uh, that because you are a reputable company or because you are not the bad actor yourself, um, that you are immune from FTC scrutiny. In other contexts, uh, the FTC has used this law enforcement tactic. Years ago, it employed something called Operation Choke Point, where rather, rather than just go after the bad actors, it tried to choke off their funds by going after their payment processors. As a recent example uh, in the tech space, the FTC released a policy statement on the use of biometric information and noted that one thing it will look at is whether businesses adequately evaluate the practices and capabilities of third parties. So that is something that you're going to need to think about when contracting with your vendors, your suppliers, your customers, if you're using AI or deploying data generally. Um, a quick word on uh, discrimination. The FTC's concern is uh, essentially the automation of discrimination in hiring, housing, or the provision of services. Candidly, some of these practices don't fit, fall squarely within uh, the FTC's bailiwick. Um, and I think that we'll get back to this later in the presentation, but something like job discrimination is typically enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission here. But the FTC does enforce laws like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which prohibits discrimination against credit applicants. And it is increasingly partnering with other regulators so that if something falls within its jurisdictional cracks, um, it can be sure to capture that conduct by partnering with other regulators like the Department of Justice, for example. Um, I, think, I think the takeaway is, uh, regardless of what industry you're in, um, you're going to be scrutinized. We can go to the next slide. So I want to contrast what Eric just discussed around consumer protection and the FTC and Lena Khan with what's on the screen, which was the generic question I asked, not generic, it was a fairly specific question. 
that I asked Bing last week on what are the consumer protection issues around generative AI. And what we see generated is all accurate in this case and all bland. Everything is generic in the answers that you get. There's no thought process behind it because it's only a predictive tool. So what are the gener consumer protection issues around generative AI? From the data that it is ingested, the generative AI chatbot through the large language model, it said that generative AI will have deceptive acts and practices and will give you the most, um, the most non-sophisticated answer around it, inaccurate representations about how AI uses training data to build models or unfair acts and practices protect against reasonably, for un reasonably foreseeable misuse or privacy, including personal information. The point is, is that this, this tool continues to generate um, bland and uh, non-descriptive, non-sophisticated answers. And it's important when one thinks about how the FTC will be regulating in this space, it's the same point that when you get to um, unfair practices that are overreaching promises or ways in which people um, misuse data. Um, and it's always done in the most bland and un not unsophisticated way, but what is the next predicted word? So I did want to, to point out that this is their answer as to what the consumer protection issues are around generative AI, as opposed to what Eric has given you in the prior slide. And please, next slide, please. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Todd said that. And, and if you practice in the FTC consumer protection space, like we do, um, the creation of the previous slide isn't surprising at all um, because when when you use technology to try to predict um, what are the FTC's enforcement priorities or what is the FTC really thinking about whether it's AI or anything else you're going to get results that rely heavily on words like deception and unfairness they are intentionally broad um, Todd used the word bland I think it's appropriate the intentionally broad and bland words. Um, these are words that come from uh, the, the, the FTC's statute. Uh, the law that it enforces most frequently is Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Um, that has been the law since 1938. It hasn't changed. What deception means and what unfairness means um, have had some gloss and detail added to them uh, by the FTC issuing policy statements. You can see these were issued in the early 1980s. This is not new stuff. Uh, what is deception? A misrepresentation or an omission that is material. Material meaning it, it would impact the consumer's decision to, to purchase something and is likely to mislead consumers acting reasonably under the circumstances. That third prong is actually quite important. During the 1970s, when the FTC was accused of being the national nanny um, under, under Chair Perchuk, um, th there was a perception that the FTC was in the business of protecting the most you know, gullible of the population. Um, I can't use other words to describe them. I'd be canceled. But now, now, now the reasonable uh, uh, standard is is what we've had. We've had it for four decades, and again, it's reasonable under the circumstances. So, um, a senior citizen's uh, interpretation of an advertisement might be different than you know a younger person, an English speaker versus a non-English speaker. You understand what I'm saying? Um, but but there is a reasonableness standard. Notably, the FTC does not have to prove that consumers suffered injury in order to bring a deception case. When we talk about injury, we're talking about unfairness. 
uh, an act or practice that is likely to cause or actually does cause substantial consumer injury. It's not reasonably avoidable by consumers. It's not outweighed by countervailing benefits. There's a bit of a balancing test here. Um, I don't have numbers on this, but just from, you know, from our experience in the space, um, and I think Steve would agree, that the, the bulk of law enforcement actions on the consumer protection side over the past few decades um, have been filed under the FTC's deception authority. But we are seeing an uptick in the use of its unfairness authority. And I really think that the use of AI uh, falls neatly within that bucket um, where you are a consumer and you think that you are reading an authentic advertisement or an endorsement and you're, and you're interacting with a computer. It's something that's difficult to avoid. Um, I, 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 that's unfairness. Um, but again, you know, these are, these are old concepts. Um, in the New York Times op-ed that we just talked about, Chair Khan wrote about AI that although these tools are novel, they are not exempt from existing rules. The FTC will vigorously enforce the laws we are charged with administering even in this new market. The theme is as technology evolves, as conduct changes, the law essentially stays the same. And uh, Congress wrote the law intentionally broadly enough to capture radio technology in 1939, online advertising in the 90s, social media and influencers in the aughts, and AI today. We can go to the next slide. So following the theme, um, I then asked the uh, Google Bard, what's the FTC doing in the field regarding um, AI and consumer protection and or unfair business practices? And again, very much a tool giving an answer that is generic, some specificity within it, especially around investigating potential violations. And there's an open investigation as to whether OpenAI violated the law and has a, a CID have been issued for their uh, large language model for ChatGPT and GPT 4.0. But what was interesting was in bringing enforcement actions, Google Bard generated the answer saying that the FTC earlier, FTC find into it, $141 million for using generative AI to create fake news stories about TurboTax competitors. The FTC did fine FTC $141 million, but not for using generative AI to create fake news stories about TurboTax competitors. But within the complaint, there were allegations around statements made by Intuit about um, TurboTax competitors, but not from generative AI. And this goes to the point where we're in the 18% where they're still generating hallucinations because, again, it's predictive of what people want to hear, which is that, oh, this is a link between what the FTC is doing, generative AI, and consumer protection. And it's just a string of words where they were close they were closely generated, but they aren't necessarily true. And that was last week with Google Bard, which is now in version, that's version two mentioned at the bottom, was that Google Bard gives multiple answers um, that you can then pick and choose from. This just happened to be the second answer that they provided. And you can turn the page. So I'll, I'll jump in here uh, on this one. And I think it's probably helpful for the audience to understand. Um, one, we're focusing on the FTC, as Eric said at the outset, it, it's the largest consumer protection agency here in the States. It wields incredible enforcement and investigative authority. But what we've seen, particularly over the last two decades, the FTC does take action against an industry participant or participants follow. So we're, we're often in a position where the FTC is driving the bus as it is, 
um, and it attracts the plaintiff's bar to actions. And in many instances, uh, we're fighting two, sometimes multiple front wars involving the exact same accused advertising or marketing practices. So how does the FTC come to start looking at this stuff? Um, historically, and by historically, I mean over the past two decades or so, our sense is that the FTC has been largely reactive to consumer complaints. It, uh, the FTC houses a consumer complaint database called the Sentinel database, where the FTC intakes complaints from consumers. Uh, the FTC also coordinates with the Better Business Bureau. Uh, and so if for some reason you find yourself uh, in a position where your Better Business Bureau rating is suffering, um, the FTC may not be that far behind. Um, what we're seeing with AI is a little different. And it's different because, as we'll talk about in a little bit, it is a new and very advanced technology. But as Eric said, we're using the same legal tools and the FTC will use the same legal tools to evaluate its use. And so the slide here is just meant to convey the point that the FTC does tend to follow the industry. As I said, they're usually reactive to consumer complaints such that when there's a critical mass or a certain volume, Eric and I have been trying to figure it out for years. We don't know what the volume is. Uh, but when there is a certain number of complaints filed against uh, one industry participant, that will usually merit some sort of involvement from the FTC, whether it's uh, a civil investigative demand, whether it's a letter, whether it's a full-blown lawsuit. It's just going to depend upon how the FTC is looking at that conduct and looking at the potential for consumer harm. Uh, so for those of you that are north of 40, like all of us on the panel, um, Back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, people sold a lot of things over infomercials. Some were sold compliantly, some were not. Um, the FTC reacted to that when uh, consumers complained that products that they were buying over infomercials or through 1-800 numbers were nothing but snake oil. The FTC took action. Uh, in the 2000s, we have the dawn of the internet and we have the dawn of internet sales. Um, the actions of many um, bad actors uh, during the aughts, um, particularly with respect to subscription sales of a product or a service, actually led Congress to enact what's called the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act, or ROSCA, uh, uh, for us in the trade. And, and essentially what ROSCA does is it permits the Federal Trade Commission to go right into federal court, get injunctive relief, uh, uh, for people that are misrepresenting subscription sales, uh, uh, the terms of them. In other words, you know, hey, $5.99 for, uh, for shipping and handling and you get this free product, but we're not going to tell you that if you don't cancel, we're going to charge you 90 bucks a month for the next forever to send this product to you. Um, that, that led to the enactment of Roscoe and, and some of the more what we would call higher risk verticals are here on the slide. Uh, anything sold on subscription uh, in the nutraceutical space, uh, skin cream, credit repair, particularly payday loans. And this all ties back in with what Eric was talking about earlier, um, that if you're doing these things and you're doing them unlawfully, the FTC will come after you. If you're doing them unlawfully and you're targeting what the FTC perceived as high-risk audiences, they're really going to drop a hammer on you. Um, so we can go to the, the next slide. And so as I said before, um, people, uh, companies that market particularly on the internet, obviously, um, have been using some version of artificial intelligence for the past almost two decades. This is your standard uh, cookie technology, your web beacon technology, all of which, you know, there's the double click cookie. Um, basically, this technology would permit advertisers and digital marketers, including affiliate marketing uh, folks and affiliate marketing networks, to track a consumer's web surfing behavior so that uh, more relevant advertising can be delivered to that consumer. This started way back in the mid aughts uh, with bolt-on technology that literally would be bolted onto the local ISP to track 
uh, the folks that were on that particular server and their surfing activities. It's now become much more advanced, obviously. Um, but the theory behind this is that there is actually a very good pro-consumer argument for the use of this type of technology to better target advertising to consumers, and it's simple. Um, if Eric Berman, my colleague and partner, doesn't like golf, but he lands on his Facebook page and I pay 10 bucks to send him an advertisement for a golf club, I might as well have just lit that 10 bucks on fire. But since I know that Eric likes wrestling uh, from his web surfing activities and I deliver him, you know, the tickets are going on sale for a wrestling event that are coming to the DC area, I've now spent my money wisely. And so if I'm spending my money wisely on advertising and marketing such that it's better targeted uh, and more useful to the recipient, the theory is that prices either stay constant or they go down. So we're not wasting money on advertising and marketing. We're actually using it very wisely. Um, the problem with that is, is, is that's not how a lot of marketers have used this. And this is what has drawn the, the ire of, of, of the FTC. And, and all of these technologies that are listed on the slide have all been part and parcel of a lot of FTC enforcement actions against online digital marketers, uh, whether it's the advertiser that's selling the product itself, whether it's its affiliate marketers, as Eric said earlier, there, there is still some enforcement efforts against payment processors uh, for companies that the FTC has targeted. Um, the, 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 the whole key to all of this, um, from a defense standpoint over the past two decades, has been um, if the data is anonymized, meaning if I'm targeting Eric Berman, I don't know as an advertiser that he's Eric Berman, he's just DC Blue 123, just has a random number assigned to him and with that number is associated all of his web surfing activity that I then use to better target advertising to him. Well, then there's no, there's no harm. There's no disclosure of any private information. There's no PII that's disclosed. It's all anonymized. It's all kept in this nice little secret bucket that, that no one ever really gets to see who he is. Um, one of the big concerns um, with AI is how, how is AI going to change that, if at all? because the AI technology that is out now, and as it will continue to become more and more advanced, could in theory, take a lot of that same anonymized information and sort of back their way into finding out who Eric Berman is. It's, it's sort of that analytical and, and that scary in a, in, a, in a large sense. And then the next step being, well, what happens if the AI actually learns about the personal information of the people who are surfing on the web. And that's one of the concerns that uh, was on an earlier slide that Todd had discussed about the privacy information and, and how private information is being used, disclosed, shared, what have you. Um, we can go ahead and jump to the, to the next slide. And, uh, and Steve, if you don't mind, I just wanna jump in quickly. Uh, first, I wanna uh, thank you for ruining my credibility with this audience and outing me as a pro wrestling fan um i also uh, want to I, I see that there's a question in the chat uh regarding regulation of, of medical devices and and so the short answer is that um the, the ftc and fda often overlap with each other they actually have um, a memorandum of understanding that roughly allocates what each agency does the ftc would regulate uh, the truth or falsity of advertising uh, messages about the medical device, um, whereas the FDA would regulate uh, the label or whether it's misbranded. Um, and of course, if, if it's defective, that might be a consumer product issue. Um, so that's, that's the rough allocation. But if, if, it is, uh, if it's using AI to make um, a deceptive a claim about a medical device, then that would be under the FTC's bailiwick. And I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and it, it gets back, I think, Eric, to, to the point that you made earlier, particularly because this is going to touch on the biometric policy statement that we've seen recently uh, from the FTC. So so there's there's the AI in the product, and then there's the AI to come up with stuff to advertise the product. It's sort of the simplest way to sort of break it out. Um, the AI, as it's used inside of a medical device, it, 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 the, the, the company that's selling or using or the, the, the medical office that's using 
uh, uh, that device is going to be responsible, as Eric said earlier, for its, its, its whole ecosystem. Um, and so there's going to need to be investigation into what are the securities and safeguards around the AI to make sure that, for example, PII and, and health data of, of patients uh, isn't being shared. Um, which is uh, all part and parcel of this. It's just a more specific area that the that the FTC is focused on uh, more recently. Um, and and so this slide, it's just it's it's just a continuation of what we were talking about uh, before. Um, again, it's you know Eric's slide earlier. You know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, that's that's essentially what we have here. Um, the only real um, setback for the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, uh, over the last couple of years is a case from the Supreme Court called the AMG case. Um, prior to AMG, the FTC would literally go in, go into court, knock on the judge's door, file their complaint and a motion for a temporary restraining order, all ex parte and under seal, such that the defendants didn't even know they were being sued. The judge would sign a TRO, a temporary restraining order that would essentially shut the whole company down, freeze all of the individual defendants' assets, appoint a receiver to determine whether or not the business could be run lawfully. And up shocker, not one has ever determined that a defendant in a TC case could be operated lawfully, despite very uh, vigorous objections by us along the way in some of the cases. Um, the Supreme Court basically said in AMG, like, look, you don't have that authority under your broad Section 5 authority. You might have it under specific statutes like ROSCA, which we discussed earlier, um, but you don't have it under Section 5. So what, what has the FTC done? It's pivot. Um, it is using its authority, more specific authority under these other various statutes. Because if you think of AI, th there's there's a million, infinite possibilities for its use, right? But in this context, we're talking about advertising and marketing and consumer protection. Uh, and so um, we'll talk about a case in a second. What, what the FTC is essentially doing now is it's saying, well, we've got all this other authority. We're just going to have this AI component be a bolt onto it as just part of our deception case. And that's how we're going to come and get relief. We're going to go ahead to the next slide. And so this is the case I was just referencing. And I, I, Eric, if you want to chime in on, on this one as well. So this is a very recent case. It was just filed in August of 2023. The FTC was able to obtain that draconian uh, temporary restraining order relief that I was, I was just describing. But if you look at this case, one of the FTC's enforcement priorities over the past decade has been going after businesses and, and individuals who are advertising and marketing get-rich-quick schemes, how to start an online business schemes, what are known as business opportunity schemes. Um, and, and they were really a heightened target. Um, and, and Eric and I have actually handled a, a number of those cases. Um, this was that case, except with the AI kicker uh, on it. And, and what, what these uh, defendants were uh, marketing was that, look, you can come and we'll help you set up your online store. We're going to run everything from you. And we've got this great artificial intelligence that's able to identify all of the products that are the new rate. And you're going to sell so much of this stuff. You're going to be operating at 20% profit margins per month. Look at this other consumer who came and did it. She made a million bucks in six months. And so it, it's just, again, the theme here is it's, it's, it's the same type of conduct that's been an enforcement priority for the FTC. It's just that this one had an artificial intelligence component bolted onto it, such that it enhanced the deception because the buzzword, as the FTC has said for this year, is artificial intelligence. It's the rave. Everyone's hearing about it when they tune into 60 Minutes, when they tune into their news. It, everyone is hearing about it. They're being bombarded with all this artificial intelligence information. And so when you add that on to an otherwise allegedly deceptive scheme, it's gonna make the scheme more attractive to the unsuspecting consumer. And so here the FTC took prompt action and they were able to go in and get that secret TRO uh, relief and, and essentially shut the company down and turn it over to the hands of a receiver. And Eric, I'll pause in case you wanted to amplify on any of that or tie you as well. I, I, no, I mean, I, th I think you hit it out of the park, Steve. I mean, what I what I like about this case, not, not only is it the most recent example of law enforcement involving AI, but um, to your point, it, it, I, and I would say to our audience, if you're using AI and you're wondering about, about the propriety of what you're doing, 
under consumer protection laws, one question to ask is, am I allowed to do this even if I weren't using AI? You can't make false money making claims whether you're using AI or not. You can't lie to people about how much weight they're going to use, but lose rather on your on your pill um, with or without AI. Um, so, you know, I, I like Steve's use of the word kicker. It's 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 you know, it's just it's just sort of an added allegation here. Um, but fraud is fraud, whether whether it's uh, whether it involves AI or not. And this is and it, it gets back to th th this was actually a claim about how AI can 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 improve the experience of, of the customer. Um, one of the things we do want to make sure everyone takes away from this is coming back to the unfairness prong that, that Eric was discussing earlier is because AI is so sophisticated and because it in theory has an unlimited amount of input, right? Whether it's scraping the web, whether it's coming from somewhere else, in theory, you can dump all the data you ever that ever existed into these models, okay? If you're using those tools in a way that's going to unfairly target particularly some of the populations we've been talking about today, which would be the, the, you know, the elderly, in some circumstances, veterans, and, and then uh, non-native uh, English speakers here in the States. That is gonna, that's gonna get on the FTC's radar pretty fast, uh, particularly if you're using those types of tools to target those populations with very expensive things um, that they may not be able to afford or high risk things like high interest credit cards or payday loans or, or, or anything that's going to put the, the, those consumers in a worse financial position as a result of the use of the AI to target them. And, and so it's a very broad statement. And obviously, the devil is always going to be in the details. But this is why it's important for you to consult with, with counsel in terms of how these tools are used in a marketing sense. There are very pro-consumer ways that these tools can continue to be used. It's just understanding where, where the lines are so that you're not unfairly targeting suspect populations and getting yourself onto the, uh, the, the radar screens of regulators here in the States. We can uh, go to the next slide. And so the FTC has been very vocal uh, as we've been talking uh, uh, you know, through this presentation. Um, this is just this is just uh, further confirmation and evidence that they are paying very close attention to this. And 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 one one thing to keep in mind, and I don't think this point can be stressed enough, is that the FTC doesn't really like rulemaking. They like their broad authority, and they've never seen you know a, a square peg that they can't fit you know a, a square peg they can't put it into a round hole. I mean they they will literally take their existing tools and just argue that it, it, that it applies broadly to any conduct, that they don't need any more specific authority. And so this is them communicating out to say, you know, look, and we'll, we'll talk, we've got a summary slide coming up here that sort of lays out the general rules for moving forward. It's, it, it's basically, look, people need to know if they're talking to a computer, okay? People need to know if they're being presented something that is not a traditional advertisement, but something that was generated just for them using AI based upon their web surfing tools. There is a concept of transparency here uh, that, that the FTC is pushing in terms of how these tools are used. So it isn't necessarily using the tools to create claims for your products or services, which is also covered by the FTC. It's actually how you're using these tools, period. And, 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 and describing to the consumers and potential customers, this is what we're using AI for, this is what we're going to use the data for. We're not going to let the LLM models, you know, train their stuff on it. It's just going to be for you and our purposes. Very clear disclosure statements like that is where this is all heading. And, 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 and this isn't something that's necessarily buried in a privacy policy. This is something, for example, if you've got a chat bot, you know, on your website, that there's a disclosure that pops up that says, hey, just so you know, you're talking to a computer. We're using a third party. The third party is going to have it on recording, okay? But we're only using it to improve your customer service or, or, or whatever we're using it for. It's that type of clarity that, that 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 is starting to be required 
and, and we're divining it through these statements from the FTC. I think we've got another one that comes right after this one here. Next slide, please. Right. So it's 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 the it's the same concept of clarity and transparency. And this is this one's this one's actually directed towards what Eric was talking about earlier, which is there's a difference between a, a, a paid ad and a non-paid ad, right? So if there is an endorsement that's been generated by an AI tool, you're probably in the land of deception right away because that endorsement needs to come from an actual customer who's used the product and who truthfully shares whatever it is that they're saying about the product, okay? So, so this is, again, just touching on some of the different ways that AI can be used on the actual affirmative advertising side rather than being used internally to target or for some other purposes. Uh, we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. And so this was the summary slide I was talking about earlier. And, and, and this is really, um, you know, again, we're, we're, and Todd and Eric and I, we meet uh, every other week uh, to talk about current events in AI. And we're still in the wild, wild west stages to use a, a US uh, metaphor, uh, meaning that there, there isn't really a lot of contours around what the law requires, what's prohibited and the like. And, and so uh, the statements that are being put out by, by folks like the FTC and any state AGs as they start catching up, because there are some states in this country that are looking at AI legislation right now, um, anything that they can you know, throw us a bone on is, is useful for us to be able to advise our clients. And th these are some of the rules that, just the sort of general rules to the, of the road that, that, that have come out from the FTC. The, the one I want to focus on, and I'll, I'll actually be able to turn this back over to Todd because he knows more about the sort of accuracy of the zeros and the ones how these models work than I do. Um, the FTC wants industry to make sure that their models are empirically sound, such that if you are putting an AI tool out there and someone's using it, that the answer is going to be correct. As Todd said earlier, we're not the sugar yet, right? Um, and so it, it, it is it is this sort of we're, we're in this sort of weird paradox right now where there are a lot of useful and good things that AI can be used for. But there's also a lot of questions about accuracy uh, and what these things are used for. You know, for example, are they going to be used for medical diagnoses? Are they going to be used to, you know, to resolve insurance claims? Um, these are answers that need to be correct. Right. Um, or else there could be a significant amount uh, of consumer harm. But for, for now, th these are the rules of the road that the FTC is, has said we need to be following. And so, uh, again, transparency, uh, more of it is always better. Uh, and then in dealing with the models, I'll, I'll turn that back over to Todd because I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, he can touch on uh, better than I can. Thanks, Stephen. Um, the next slide, please. So. Uh, Late middle of last month, the FTC Division of Advertising Practices issued on the uh, FTC business blog guidance on, uh, and this is the the title, was can't lose what you never had, claims about di digital ownership and creation in the age of generative AI. And what was interesting about the FTC's um, guidance was that it had four key points around generative AI. And the first one is a particularly controversial point that they made, which is to inform, inform consumers about whether training data includes copyrighted or otherwise protected material, as in potentially private information, public um, and personal information. So what does it mean for the training data if it uses copyrighted information? We all know that most, if not all, of the large language models have scraped a significant portion of their data from the internet. And that includes almost certainly a significant portion of copyrighted data. And that copyrighted data um, may, or not, may, or not, may or may not be legally obtained. There's a question around fair use and derivative uses under the Copyright Act in the United States, as well as globally. But what was interesting about the FTC was the statement that that AI generative companies should inform consumers what training data was used for, what training data was used. Because if they are using copyrighted or otherwise protected material, there's a significant issue 
as to whether or not they have an obligation to disclose that. That is part of what is a significant part of the different lawsuits that are out there around generative AI. And for the FTC to come out and say that there may be a requirement to inform consumers about what the training data includes is a significant change and step forward in AI governance. The second part was what Stephen was mentioning around you can't try to fool people that the AI generated works were created by humans. So that you do have to disclose um, that the AI chatbot generated the answer, not human beings. As well, a significant difference in ownership versus licensing when you use AI tools and when you use digital tools, the digital versus non-digital goods piece, an obligation for companies to describe, to disclose that there are different terms for digital goods than there are for non-digital goods. This is the sale versus licensing issue. Whether or not you own your iPod music, to date myself, who would have thought we were already past iPod ownership of music, but the streaming services and non-digital good that's licensed as opposed to ownership of the underlying music that you are streaming. So there's an obligation for companies to describe and to, um, to educate consumers as to whether or not the differences of what they're purchasing from a digital good versus a non-digital good. And then they added a provision around platforms that allow creators to post um, AI generated material as well as other, other actual copyrighted material on a platform and an obligation for these platforms to both allow creators access to the, to the materials they post and also the ability to remove their works. So this is a very significant step forward in the FTC guidance around the use of AI and generative AI in, in the intellectual property space and in coming out um, before court cases have answered a lot of the questions around generative AI. Next slide. And finally, we wanted to end um, on the last part and open it to questions after is, what jurisdictions and regulators do that in-house counsel actually need to focus on in the consumer protection space. And we have provisions around the European Union and the European Economic Administration, the EEA. Um, we all know the term, <laughs> the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and the, general, and the Data Protection Authorities, all of whom have already acted um, strongly in areas of generative AI to the point where the Italian regulators prohibited the use of chat GPT for a month in last April and May um, around the use of personal information and in particular around the use of children's personal information and assurances that OpenAI was not using them. Changes to chat GPT allowed for OpenAI to uh, reopen and reuse and re allow the usage of chat GPT in Italy. But you've had similar inquiries from the Irish, the Norwegians, as well as the Belgians. There are a lot of action around generative AI in the new European Center for Algorithmic Transparency. Again, this is in many instances around the FTC style um, dark patterns, and as well as the prohibition of of having people, the example that Stephen gave of the initial uh, payment of $5.99 for the good and then a long-term $90 a month, algorithms drive those quite a few. Um, and then we've got um, right now in the middle, of, we're in the middle of, a, of the outcome of the European Union's AI Act, which is currently in the trilogue process between the European Commission, the European Council, and the European Parliament, where they're working out what the EU AI Act will be. So with all the discussion we've had 
around the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. and consumer protection, the real, the more, much more significant activity on the regulatory space side and on the enforcement side will be in the EU, as we've seen um, historically now in the data protection area. It's extending to the artificial intelligence, and we've also known that this has significant um, work in the EU around the Digital Services and Digital Markets Act, which we left off the slide, but all part of uh, consumer protection was an underlying theme in almost all of these actions by the EU. And then we come back to the US. Um, we mentioned, Eric mentioned earlier, the EEOC and its um, discrimination uh, authority and around, there's a company called DHI Group that had released a uh, a job search AI tool um, that ended up violating national origin discrimination because it wasn't surfacing any um, anybody's anyone's uh, resumes that did not include H1B eligibility, and therefore were it was determined that they were engaged in national origin discrimination because U.S. citizens weren't appearing in any of the, their resumes weren't being put through the system because they didn't include the words uh, uh, H-1B visa eligible and therefore they were being discriminated against. And DICE had to go back and pull out its algorithm and pull out its AI tool and adjust it and strike the parts that were driving the discrimination. A long series of additional um, areas in which consumer protection will be touched upon by the um, alphabet soup of U.S. regulatory agencies, and then there are some of the lawsuits that are there below. So um, I know we're short on time, and we are open to any questions, but thank you very much. Thanks all. On a final note, I'd like to ask Todd, Stephen, and Eric if you have any key takeaways to share with the audience. Well, my, my key takeaway is around the use of generative AI and its non-authenticity um, and, the, and the actual need for people to um, check what is produced and that that and that working as a tool to uh, to make sure that it's accurate is most important with the use of AI tools. And I'll turn it over to Stephen and Eric around consumer protection. Yeah, I mean that Todd's takeaway is is, is spot on, and it, it it applies on the consumer protection side as well because whether again if we think about the two main uses, there's sort of the the internal uses for analyzing how to market or target particular audiences with the AI tool, which again, if done lawfully, can be very efficient and, and very effective, um, both from a conversion standpoint as well as from a cost standpoint. Um, and then there's the, you know, then there's the making available the AI and, and actually selling something or bolting it onto something and saying, hey, We've got this great service, and in addition, we we use AI to make it even better. Um, all of those all of those claims in terms of consumer facing about what the AI can and cannot do it hits right on Todd's point about accuracy and completeness. We do have a garbage in, garbage out problem. So so the the source of the data uh, is obviously critical, and and there's all there's all different types of reps and warranties. Uh, what, you know, if you're getting that data from a third party source, that you're going to want. Uh, uh, that's, you know, if you're not just scraping the internet, but you're actually getting it from another data source, you're going to want reps and warranties about the accuracy and completeness of the data. Because all of that comes back to what Eric said earlier, which is, you know, fraud is fraud. And if you're making a claim about your tool that, that, that is not capable of substantiation, then, then you're in the land of deception and, and, and the FTC may come and knock it. I'll, I'll just echo everything that Steve and Todd said. We're, we're at the top of the hour. I guess my, my only uh, final point would be uh, on the previous slide, we, we talked about other regulators that are looking at this abroad and in the U.S. 
um, what we didn't note, but but we should, um, state attorneys general just yesterday, uh, a coalition of 54 state attorneys general, states and territories, uh, sent a letter to Congress asking it to um, investigate the use of AI uh, and then how it can be used to exploit children. Um, the subject matter is probably not as relevant to this audience, but the point is um, similar to what Steve said earlier, we're, we're in the wild west. Um, regulation of this technology is still nascent and there is um, uh, you know, sort of a momentum effect where as, as each new regulator gloms on and decides this is something worth looking at, um, others eventually do too until there's legislation. Brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, today and also thank you so much to the audience for joining. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.